Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our 16th USAP Helm Engage. Today with Professor Loisu Nongcha, Building the Pipeline, Creating a Conducive Environment for Early Career Academics. A warm welcome to everyone here in the Zoom room, and especially a warm welcome to our esteemed speaker, Professor Yisu Nongta, who I will introduce in a minute. So just quickly how we spend the next hour with one another. We've got an hour from two till three for this engage. Prof has prepared a PowerPoint and will share with us for about an hour, about half an hour. And then we have time for questions and answers. Um, so please pop your questions and comments in the chat. We record the session as always, and you can view the recording tomorrow in the Yusuf Helm YouTube channel. The evaluation link, um, our tech team will pop into the chat towards the end. I can see that when people enter the um, microphone drop on, if you can just pop those off, thank you. So to contextualize our engagement today, there is an enduring theme for the past two decades that there is the notion of the aging white male professoriate. There's urgency to cultivate a succession of early career academics poised to replace those phasing out of the system. However, various factors hinder these emergent scholars within our system, from inadequate funding at the postgraduate level to this attraction of better salary offered by governments and the private sector. Given that early career academics are already navigating a host of challenges from job insecurity to the pressures of publish or perish, these issues can significantly hamper their professorial The Early Career Academics Advancement Program and the new generation of academics program, the NGAP as we know it, are other such initiatives which are in place to assist emerging academics, but these are selective. AGIs, retired and senior academics have an imperative to lobby for systemic changes that make research funding more accessible, more transparent and supportive of young academics. Moreover, the establishment of a campus atmosphere conducive to the flourishing of young scholars remains vital. Exploring these issues will be a leader of our sector, Professor Nongsa, former Vice Chancellor of WITS and Head of the National Graduate Academy of Mathematics and Statistical Sciences at the University. He attended, um, here's the bio, I want to read you the bio um, of Prof. He attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar, on a Rhodes Scholarship and obtained his doctorate in mathematics in 1982. He retired then as ad hominem professor in mathematics at the University of the Witwatersrand in December 2018. From 2003 to 13, he was the Vice Chancellor and Principal at WITS and is currently Professor Emeritus at WITS University, um, Honorary Professor at the University of Pretoria and Extraordinary um, Professor at UWC. He served as the Chairperson um, of the Board of the South African National Research Foundation 2014 to 18, um, and he was appointed by the Minister of um, the Minister of the DGT as Administrator of the University of the Forte um, from 2019 to 2020. He was elected as Vice President of the International <laughs> Mathematical Union at the annual general meeting in Sao Paulo in 2018, where he served as the liaison between the IMU and UNESCO, as well as with the International Science Council. For the last few years, he has been one of the champions of the National Graduate Academy for Mathematical and Statistical Sciences, which focuses on the development of the next generation of mathematicians and statisticians in South Africa. So today's talk, especially for our young emerging scholars, but also for senior leadership and policy makers. We hope you enjoy this talk very much. Um, Prof, we welcome you and we look very much forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very, very much. Over to you. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. And thanks for the invitation to share some of the things that I think about uh, while I'm enjoying my retirement. As we have had, I obtained my PhD in 1982. And the people that I'll be 
talking about today were not born. That mainly people who are at most 40 years old. I'll try and share my presentation, which is, and then do that. And then uh, slideshow, where's slideshow, okay. At the top in the middle? Yeah. That bar comes up when I... Um, you can say play from start. Can you see the top left? Go left. No, press uh, it. Now go left. From, oh, okay, yeah, I got it. Okay. <clears throat> this has already been covered. The title of my talk is Shaping the Future and kind of making an argument for a systemic focus on early career academics. Um, I'll start off with, this is now not moving. You see, you've got little arrows at the bottom here. Yeah, oh, uh, okay, yeah. I start off with a few disclaimers. Um, the views that I express here might be a little bit old-fashioned and not keeping abreast of developments in higher education. Um, I was in administration more than 10 years ago and stepped down from that. I've retired as an academic. Uh, and uh, as has already been pointed out, my focus for the last 10 years has been on mathematical sciences. And over the last so many years, uh, I've not kept abreast of developments. Raf, you've just gone mute for a second. There Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back, perfect. Okay. And um, I might appear or sound to be generalizing and making statements about things that maybe I assume that or claim that they apply across the system. They don't. And basically, I would like to stimulate some debate amongst the people, both attending and policymakers and decision makers, about some of the things that have been happening over the last so many years. Um, Right. Since about 1995, I use 1995 because there was uh, a publication of a report on the Commission on Higher Education. Um, there have been quite a number of initiatives which are aimed at early career academics. Uh, the language is that of national system of innovation, which would be academia, business, NGOs, and uh, government, but mainly these have come from the public sector. So the obvious question is, can, can we just identify the dimensions that have been addressed by these interventions? <clears throat> For example, have they addressed transformation in terms of race and gender? Have they addressed uh, uh, transformation in terms of knowledge base? Uh, what are the uh, specialities within our science system? Uh, the other point that we can reflect on is whether when it looks at these interventions, there are areas that have been neglected. Uh, these interventions are usually designed elsewhere, let's say by policymakers, leaders of universities. To what extent have they taken into consideration the views or voices of any career academics? And I'm making here a simple statement that an investment in early career academics is an investment into a vibrant future of our science system. And therefore, <clears throat> what obligations do the current leaders of our systems have in shaping that future? And lastly, uh, has somebody looked at all these initiatives and identified whether they are self-consistent or the or the inconsistent among the inconsistencies amongst them. Now, when you look at these interventions, I'm not going to list all of them. One of the things that uh, crops up is that of the terminology, terminology that is being used. And sometimes, therefore, it creates the question as to whether we're talking about the same thing. You'll hear the use of the term early career academics, which is the one I'll be using frequently. 
Uh, the NRF uses the term emerging researchers um, and or the early career researchers. When you look at documents from the Department of Education and Training, you come across next generation of academics and, and there's some uh, kind of plans that refer to early and mid-career researchers and scholars. Now, in, in these definitions, the qualifications of the people that are potential beneficiaries. Uh, you'll find that in some cases, I mean, in most cases, for those that have finished a PhD, the PhD should have been completed within a certain number of years. It could be five, six, seven, eight, but those that I've looked at, minimum has been five, and I haven't come across any where somebody who finished their PhD more than 10 years ago would be a beneficiary. Now, some, uh, of course, there is a, uh, a push for people to finish PhDs. Now, the question is whether those who are not registered for PhD and don't have PhDs, whether they are included in this, or do we go further down and look at people who are doing masters or even honors degrees? Now, there would be, thirdly, there would be an age restriction. Uh, well, no, <laughs> let me qualify that. There will be in some of them a reference to age. I think the NRF for the Y rating is people who are not more than 35 years old, being a mathematician and the prestigious prize is the, um, the Fields Medal, you must not be more than 40 years old. And for some of these, there's no age restriction. And lastly, who is the employer? I've already indicated that Although the terminology is that of the National System of Innovation, which means that there are three or four sectors that are supposed to be working together. Uh, by and large, uh, these initiatives focus on people working within the university sector. And one of the things that kind of crops up is whether postdocs are employees, Maybe they are not in terms of some agreement with SARS. Are they included in these initiatives? What about people employed by industry and government? All right. Some examples of shaping the future. That is, the future, of course, everybody knows what that is. Can we do something for a desired future in terms of what we'd like to see in the future? There are some examples within our system of this. There's a national plan for education, which was published in 2001. Uh, with some goals about how the higher education sector should look like. Around 2008, there was a 10-year plan released by the Department of Science and Technology, uh, whose life expired in 2018. Uh, you will recall that around about 2013, uh, former minister Trevor Manuel led an initiative which led to uh, the uh, development of the National Development Plan for 2030, our future make it work. Now, last year, there was a release of a second 10-year plan, which is called Science, Technology, and Innovation Decadal Plan. And this lifespan is supposed to be from 2022 to 2023. So the question that I ask is, in this presentation, can we, reflect on how the system might look like by 2050. Um, the system, let's say the university system or the national system of innovation. And with that in mind, I will use a definition of early career academic as people who are... Oh, who are no more than 40 years old, uh, secondly, they have completed their PhDs in the last between five and 10 years and will include postdoctoral fellows because those are people who have taken a decision that they are going to be academics or researchers, whatever. And these are people who have not reached the level of an associate professor. I remember we had a big debate with somebody who had reached a level of an associate professor but was less than 40 years old. And we felt that the person had already established themselves. And we would like people who have an objective of at some stage completing a PhD. Right. Now, just a reflection on how these initiatives have evolved over time. Um, when I was employed as a junior lecturer, 
many years ago. Uh, by and large, there was no pressure to, I had an honors degree. There was no pressure to study further. And nobody cared about whether I did or not. So I was on my own. Uh, and I use that slogan, uh, people maybe in the uh, audience of my generation will recall that slogan, XXX, you are on your own. Around about 1983, 84, <clears throat> the predecessor to the NRF known as the Foundation for Research Develop for Research Foundation for, for Research Development, sorry, introduced ratings and, and in that the rating of young people less than 35. Um, Round about the 1980s, and I think this is ongoing, universities leverage funding from uh, donors to grow their own timber, namely appoint young people who would be trained, masters and PhD, and, and take up position within the universities. Uh, around about 2000, there was the FRD introduced to Tuka Part 1, and I think I say this on the correction. It was only for people with PhDs, and um, around about 2007 or thereabout, Higher Education South Africa, which was succeeded by USAF, University of South Africa, um, developed this program called the Next Generation of Academics. Uh, we now have NRF to Tuka Part 2, which also includes people who will be studying for PhDs. Um, I think around about 2017-18, there was the Black Academics Advancement Program and 2020, the Future Professors Program. This is not an exhaustive list, but I think I've covered most of them. No, no, no. Yeah, yes. Uh, there's one that was developed during the time that I was on the NRF board called the uh, Research Mentoring and Exceptional Early Career Advancement Program. I learned about a month ago that this, this has not yet been funded. Within the National Graduate Academy, um, we have the Pathways to a Successful Academic Career Program. Uh, this is for people in the mathematical sciences. Uh, this year, USAF uh, launched this platform called TUSO Resources, aimed at early career academics. And I am excited to remind you that the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust, of which I'm a trustee, launched a prestigious award known as the New Frontiers Research Award. Now, let's look at what are the characteristics of these programs. Let's say start with the New Frontiers Research Award. It, it recognizes the efforts of visionary early to mid career researchers determined to build high performance research teams. Um, the award is intended to provide leading researchers with the freedom and flexibility to pursue their research and help them produce significant work and gain international recognition. Generously funded, over the five years, one will receive 7.5 million rands. Uh, leading researchers and scholars program A to support South Africans, uh, particularly Black, particular African and colored, uh, uh, who are employed at universities to become internationally leading researchers. Support exceptionally early career and experienced mid career researchers, and support advanced career researchers and scholars who already have considerable international recognition to transition to become internationally leading researchers and scholars in their field. There's a message that is emerging here about the target group and what is intended. And a corollary to that, there's a group of people that in my view are overlooked or maybe not receiving adequate attention. Future Professors Program, <clears throat> um, it says we prepare, the Future Professors Program serves the best and brightest of a transformed next generation South African professoriate. Our purpose is to build capacity in the South African national system by preparing lecturer and senior lecturer equivalent staff for the professoriate. So it's people that have potential to be professors. Not everybody in our system, of course, becomes a professor. Okay. And 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 um, it, it also mentions how they do that. And then the two sort of resources is a toolbox to help of resources <clears throat> for any career researchers and scholars, which has been developed in response to studies 
which showed the need for this kind of support for early career academics. So USAF kind of and others um, commissioned an investigation of what are the needs of early career academics and, and uh, how can this be provided? Black Academics Advancement Program looks at the underrepresentation of black of black academics, especially those who are South African citizens, uh, in the professoriate, and it looks at people that, uh, or is aimed at people that will be rated basically. Now, what I would like to draw your attention to is that it is restrictive. Right at the bottom there, it says, ideally, two awards per annum will be made to each university. Okay. So out of the so many early career academics at the University of Pretoria, only two per year will be recommended for support. What about the others? <clears throat> now, what comes through for me in when I looked at this is that there's a big focus on being selective and it's aimed at the people who have got potential to be excellent as reflected possibly by the NRF rating. Now, the document itself does give some figures about the underrepresentation of black academics and females amongst those who are rated. And, and if you look for instance, and say that says that black South African citizens made up only 6% of the NRF rated researchers. And only six of these researchers achieved an A rating out of how many? 3,392. Now, this information is available on the web of the NRF. I had a quick look uh, uh, this morning just to remind myself, currently the numbers have increased somehow to 4,452, 130 are A rated, 797 are B rated. The question then becomes, what proportion of the total academic staff population do these figures represent? 130 out of how many? In my view, this should be way less even than 5%. Or if you combine the A rated and the B rated, what proportion of the academics in the system is this? In my, in my estimation, it should be less than 10%. So we're looking at developing people to fit into the top 10%. What about the rest of the 90, 90? What about the other 90%? I'm a mathematician, but I have this theorem in social sciences where I believe that, okay, selectivity enhances excellence. But when you look at those that are deemed excellent, disproportionately, it seems to favor people who have enjoyed some form of privilege either by being male or by being educated overseas or by having been a postdoc or having a mentor, et cetera, et cetera. And the corollary to this therefore is that an unintended consequence of selectivity is that it could exacerbate inequality. I'll give examples then about mathematics because those, that is the data that I have, okay, out of, okay, I'll, I'll summarize I'll summarize that later on. These are the figures of rated mathematicians as of 2020. <clears throat> and you can look at the last column. People have listened to me talk. They've seen this slide many times, okay? Only 19 young mathematicians are deemed promising. That's shocking. You go to statistics, how many, I'll give you the figures and only five are deemed promising in terms of an instrument that we developed ourselves as South Africans. So here's a quick summary of this. Uh, in 2020, there were 528 mathematics academics. This is from reports produced by Crest early this year. Okay? And, 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 and that is the breakdown. <clears throat> now, if we're looking at people who are less than 40 years old, there were 42%, 42% of the mathematicians currently working at our universities are less than 40 years old. Now, now what, what is their profile? What proportion of them have PhDs? What, what, what research specializations? What, what, what are their interests? Are there any areas of mathematics that are overlooked or that are not represented? 
statistics 255 and you look at people who are less than 40 years old slightly higher than in mathematics 45 percent again the same questions what proportion of them have phds uh what do they specialize in goodness goodness of fit uh distribution theory are there areas that are not represented <clears throat> now I posed a question earlier on what proportion of academics at South African universities are A rated or B rated, whatever. I have the answer for mathematics because I looked at that. It's less than 2% who, who are A rated. And it's 8% who are A or B rated. And only 3.6% are deemed promising. I find these figures depressing. I've looked at them over and over again, and it doesn't fail to shock me. And, and you look at statistics, in 2020, there were no A-rated researchers, but now I think there's one at the University of Free State. 2.8, mathematics is 8%, it's 2.8 for statistics for international acclaimed, and only 2% were deemed promising. And a number of our interventions are aimed at this group of people who constitute less than 10% of the academic population in South Africa. Now, <clears throat> this slide is for mathematics, but the first time I saw it when I was on the NRF board, it, it's no different when you look at the whole system. For me, it reflects, it shows an underinvestment in young people. And this is reflected under those columns in emerging researchers. Um, you can see the columns there for the different years that consistently there's less investment in emerging researchers than in other areas. Of course, one has to unpack these figures. What are the numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can also look at of those emerging researchers who receive this funding. Most probably it's that small group of people who are either Y rated or P rated. I'm not sure if C-rated people are included in here. So I will complete by raising a few points that we can debate today and going forward or ignore. First of all, the NRF rating is a homegrown instrument. <clears throat> and as I've already indicated is that the interventions that have been developed are designed to produce a or B rated people, international acclaimed. Okay? Now, question is, what proportion of the gross expenditure on research and development is made into this goal of producing international acclaim? I'm not questioning that we need, we need international acclaimed people, but the overemphasis, maybe let me put it that, the overemphasis on that uh, as reflected by some of these figures, for me, is something that is worth discussing. Eight, I've already 8% and 3% have achieved in uh, that status in mathematics and statistics. Um, in mathematics, there are 220 early career mathematicians, less than 40, only 19 were deemed promising. And so the question of this 19, how many will achieve that status? Statistics, only five were deemed promising. How many of these five will be international acclaimed? And should we really be so much focused on producing international acclaimed people, possibly at the expense of the rest? Right? And the point that I wish to make is that our system, and here I'm talking about our system generally, but the figures here represent it, is that these 10% of academics who are international acclaimed cannot carry on their shoulders the whole system. There are people, the other 90%, who also have a responsibility to contribute to a vibrant national system of innovation. Or So some suggestions that one can make, okay, I first of all start, with an observation that the National Development Plan set a target of 75% of academics must have PhDs by 2030, which is in seven years time. And it goes on to say that what was then HISA had developed a detailed proposal 
to develop the next generation of academics. Yeah? So we have experience of developing plans to attain certain goals. Now, I think because that is the situation in many university systems all over the globe, that the entry qualification to teach at university is a PhD. So based on this, <clears throat> what progress have we made to, first of all, have 75% by 2030? And will that plan be sufficient for us to reach a target of 100% by 2050? That's one question. Now, I know this from experience because I visit universities, try, and I, I'm a salesperson. Uh, so, and, and sometimes people tell me that, Louis, so some people at this university are not interested in doing PhDs, which therefore means, and these are young people, which therefore means that by 2050, we won't get that. So my proposal is that people who have no interest in doing PhDs must be incentivized to go to Tibet colleges and high schools, because there's a shortage of people there who are highly qualified uh, to teach at, at Tibet colleges. Now, third proposal is that uh, by 2050, um, the, 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 the university system should have transformed our areas of expertise or knowledge so that we are in a position to respond to the 21st century challenges. And you can find some of these in the second decade of plan, uh, burden of disease, climate change, energy shortage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't mean that it's the exclusion of other things. Now, I think that we still have a situation where the investment we made in the other early career academics, not in the top 10%, is kind of optional. You can do it if you want. If you don't, it's up to you. You don't get promoted. Um, I believe that we should uh, give everybody an opportunity. It should not be selective to become established and successful academics and that they realize their potential. And there is an emerging consensus about what this training should be. You can find it in the Tucson resources that's on the website. And there's a book that has been edited by professors Johnson and Fisher. And I'm grateful that they gave us about 60 copies for free, which we kind of donated to universities that have uh, uh, that have had young mathematical scientists registering for a program. I think USAF should not just leave this toolbox there for people to, to look at at their leisure. There, there should be a helm-like national program, that is a training program, just like higher education leadership and management for early career academics, which addresses the topics that are either in two sort resources, there's overlap, or in the book edited by Professor Johnson and Professor Fisher. Now, I was a university administrator, fourth point, and I know that we tend to favor people who have a track record. Yeah. If you have not established yourself, you struggle. You struggle on many fronts. You might not get research grants. You take a long time working in order to uh, get sabbatical leave. There's a complaint about workloads, which has been there for many years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Universities, uh, if they would consider looking at those HR policies and the extent to which we neglect young people. In my view, and in fact, in my previous life, I was a deputy vice chancellor for research and I visited Australia just to look at how research management was, uh, was handled there. And one of the things I learned is that um, Securing a grant from international donors, especially if there was a community process, was, was seen as a proxy for your recognition or the recognition of the importance of your work. Right? It's not only, it was, it was I mean, they don't have an, a rating. Okay? Uh, so they use that as a proxy for the standing, either of your track, I mean, track record or the work that you're going to be doing. So 
I think for those people are international acclaimed, I hope they will not be annoyed with me. They should receive matching funding when they get, when they're successful at securing uh, grants from uh, international funding bodies. Uh, fifth point is that these national programs funded by the government departments, Department of Science and Innovation, Higher Education, and which are aimed at early career academics, uh, should be open to all. And, and they should not be selective where university says that, send us five names, send us three names. And in some cases, I say this under correction is that, tell us what contribution you are going to make, what investment you are going to make in these people whose names you are going to put forward. And in conclusion is that, Early career academics should not feel that they are on their own. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, no, keep your camera on. Um, let me see that I'm on. Yeah, I am on. Um, great. Prof, you can just stop sharing on your side. That's perfect. And you can unmute yourself or the host can also unmute you. Perfect. So Prof is great and I can see there's a lot of comments coming through and I've also got some questions and I got some direct questions. So the first, <coughs> I, want to, the first I want to bother you with is um, Itumeleng is asking, how do academics who join the acad academy later in life, the over 40s for instance, and who, those who obtain a PhD later, how do they get supported? Should the years spent in academia not be an indicator rather than the straight age of a person? How do you feel about that? That's a very good question. Um, in fact, as far back as, ooh, I would say the 1990s, uh, the FRD followed by the NRF, introduced in its rank ranking and late entrant ranking. These were for people who had interrupted their academic careers, either to go and work elsewhere, or for people who took time off to bring up their children and so on. Now, in, in our, namely the National Graduate Academy, we, when we say that your PhD should have been finished in the last so many years, we say that we exclude the time that somebody was not in academia. So that there's been, there's been a consideration of um, how the time away from academia affects the development of, of, of some people. So Prof, where does, one, where does one put that kind of position forward to say that if it is straight age, it usually disadvantages women. So it's a bit of a gender, um, you know, it, it's not helping to to um, to help women advance because, of course, women often typically um, have one or two children, perhaps, and start their careers typically slightly later. So they're at a disadvantage. Um, is that something that is being considered, or is that something that is being spoken about? I would say University of South Africa would be the obvious place where issues like that would be debated. Because within University of South Africa, there's a grouping of deputy vice chancellors for research that look at research related things. Um, there, there's a community of practice possibly for human resources and so on. So I'll say that the obvious starting point would be USAF. And then of course, um, when these initiatives are launched, um, it's usually there's a discussion document that is released where people have to make an input. Also then when these discussion documents are circulated, people can make an input and say that that restriction is going to disproportionately disadvantage people or people from this particular group, whether it's women, whether people for small universities, et cetera. Perfect, great. And for the other people in the room, I just want to get you all to read the comments that are posted. Um, there are some, there was a comment about the NRF that does make an allowance for people who had to bring up uh, children. Um, and there is a wavering of the age group. Um, and there is other comments uh, that I'd like you to read. Prof, can I ask you another question that has come through? Um, if we use 
the young academics programs or any of these young emerging programs, whichever way you want to call them, if we use them um, um, to advance and to replace the professoriate, which is clearly retiring and moving on and so forth, would you consider it an effective steering mechanism for transformation, these programs? That's a very good question. Um, in fact, when I gave a related presentation some time about two months ago um, at Stellenbosch, I looked at the age profile as in a sorry about this. This sorry, I should have I should have switched off my phone. I'm terribly sorry about this. No, no, no problem. We didn't hear it. Oh, okay. We, 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 that we should look at the people who will be retiring in the next, let's say, twenty years, right? And then now, as you know, that the decision to fill this position is taken at university level, but in many cases, it's the department that says, let's say in mathematics, oh yeah, no, the person who retired works in algebra, so we must replace them with another algebra. That this presents an opportunity to transform the areas of specialization. If we were to say by 2050, what are the areas that we want to build? Mathematics for machine learning, for instance, or uh, statistics for deep learning, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, you cannot have, I don't think that you can have a university specializing in one thing. So if we look at, if we can think about communities of, of people in a specialty at different universities, then it would require universities to say that we'll appoint two in this area, you can appoint one, et cetera, et cetera. That's in, the, in case of transformation in terms of the areas of expertise. I think your question was around transformation in terms of race and gender. Um, I think there's been um, already, there have been interventions aimed at transformation in terms of race and gender. The Black Academic Advancement Program is one such. Uh, I think the next generation of academics has a preference in terms of race and gender. So uh, I think I can commend government and other people that there have been a concerted effort in terms of driving transformation in terms of race and gender, the NRF as well. But for me, there's this area of, should we be transforming? And the answer for me is yes. Should we be transforming? the areas of expertise to support what the national priorities are. Hmm. So um, I can see some comments um, in the um, in the chat section and everybody can read the comments. You welcome everyone to post questions. There's one question that came directly to me is another one. Um, so you spoke about um, the words you used, somebody was deemed not promising or they were deemed insufficient or only so many bursaries were allocated and so many support structures were allocated because people were not deemed worthy of that you know being appointed to that program would you say some of the shortcomings is on the side of the phd students on the side of the emerging scholars that perhaps we haven't published enough perhaps we haven't you know it's not published of national or international significance so is the shortcoming on the side of the candidate or are the policies and the rules that guide our allocation of the bursaries? Are they perhaps made for a different environment? You see, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about the NRF. And um, I was on the NRF board for four years and I raised this uh, at the NRF. I think the way we, I mean, the timelines and so on are just, I won't say inappropriate, but they are not, uh, they're not, they, they don't facilitate uh, kind of um, making decisions that will be representative. Let, 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 let me give you a particular example. I was teaching on our students, um, and, and by June, they were working on their honors project. And also at that time, maybe July, August, uh, students are supposed to submit applications 
to the NRA for the next degree, which is a master's or a PhD. Now in that application, they have to indicate what their research project is. This is somebody doing, starting an honors project, but they're applying for a scholarship where they are going to be evaluated amongst other things on the project that they're going to do for their masters. Now, for people, for instance, who have not even made up their mind as to what their interests are, they don't even know what the expertise is within their university, let alone at other universities, to be expected to have identified somebody that they are going to work with, and also the project that they are going to work on, is, is too much. And for a fact then, I mean, those people, they said to me that their applications were not forwarded to the NRF because their proposal was about two or three lines. It was deemed inadequate. So there's that shortcoming that I have raised with my friends at the NRF and said that let's change this and not expect applicants to be submitted and be evaluated on the quality of a research proposal for the next degree while they are doing, let's say, in honors, they are evaluated for a master's. If they want to do a PhD, they are still, uh, they are still, I mean, they are doing an honors, but they are evaluated on a research proposal for a PhD. So the answer, I mean, it's not, it's not the full answer. The answer is, in some cases, we look at what is this person going to do with a weak proposal, then it's put aside. Now, the other thing, sorry for going on on this, is mm -hmm. that there are certain instances where supervisors, potential supervisors, work with the student to develop the research proposal. And that instances where a student is supposed to be working on their own, you are on your own, okay? Now, you have these two students who have had different experiences in terms of developing this proposal, but they are going to be evaluated on the same scale. The one who has to do this on their own is at a distinct disadvantage compared to the one who already has a supervisor and the supervisor has helped them develop the submission. Yeah. Um, Prof, there's one more question from uh, Temba Khlasho at the Free State, um, Dean of Students there. He says, given the sectoral competition for high quality academics, the investment in retention of young academics is always challenging. How do you, well, you invest and then they move to another university or even leave the sector. How do we mitigate against this? Um, now I can say this because I'm retired. I'm no longer associated with a particular university. I mean, the, 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 my presentation is looking at the whole system. So, Supporting somebody at University of Johannesburg and they decide to move to the University of Forte, it doesn't bother me. And it shouldn't bother us because it's we we we, we are a unified system. The thing about universities is that uh, of course universities compete, and I can understand the university leadership, especially if they have made an investment in the development of that person and the person goes to another university. Now um Leaving academia, again, I said in my introductory remarks that in South Africa, we talk about a national system of innovation, which is supposed to be collaboration involving universities, industry, government, and NGOs. Theoretically, it's supposed to work like that. Mm -hmm. But in practice, we have not actually made much progress in that. Of course, there are some companies, let's say Sasol, your energy companies, your, some of your companies in the financial services sector that recognize that you have to make an investment in um, advanced skills and so on, I mean, in terms of knowledge production. But by and large, this system that was or the framework that we have adopted, it, we have not actually made it work in the way that it should be. So if it worked well, then you'd have a situation where there's mobility of academics and, 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 um, and people working in industry and so on, and, and crossing these borders between industry and, and universities, which is something that you find in other systems. Hmm. 
so I hear you emphasizing that if somebody moves from one institution to the other, senior staff, middle staff, emerging staff, it's not a loss to the sector because our sector just gets strengthened. Um, yes, I hear that a lot. Um, that's great. So one final questions, uh, question I want to ask you, if people want to access these kinds of support bursaries, uh, funding and so forth, are they usually managed internally by the postgraduate office, by the research office, bursary office or HR? Or do people go outside and go to the MasterCard Foundation and you know look outside? Uh, I'll start off with the uh, with the ones that let's say fund which are funded by the National Research Foundation. And I mean, I think the NRF funds no more than fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. So, but they communicate with universities, and and that information is usually through the research office of your university. Um, your your research office might make very well pass that information to faculties or directly. So it depends now within the university what is done with that information. Mm. Now with other funders, <clears throat> then it depends on who the funder is and who do they communicate with within the institution. So you would find, let's say, the accounting firms. Uh, the accounting firms, if they are going to make an investment, they are likely going to be interacting with the head of department of accounting or the engineering companies or whatever the case may be. They are likely to be interacting with communicating with the, uh, with the engineering faculty or even with, a particular, with somebody in a particular stream within, within that faculty. And what the person who receives that information does with the information also varies from individual to individual. Mm -hmm. There are some people who receive the information, they pass it on. There are some people who receive the information and they sit on it because maybe they think that it's not going to benefit. They can't think of anybody mm -hmm. that they know who's going to benefit from that. So there's also that weakness within our universities mm -hmm. of the flow of information about funding opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I hear you say that if, if somebody's interested, they start with an NRF, then they go to their own faculties and departments, and then perhaps internally, and they get referred elsewhere from there. Um, yeah. Um, Prof, um, there was one more question, but I'm worrying about time. Um, That's okay. And there was a comment by Kavish and somebody else earlier on about the cooperation. I see that, sorry, it's about cooperating, how the system needs to cooperate. And that's exactly what you said. Whether we've got a, an emerging academic, you know, from Forte or from Wits, and they move around, they're not lost to the sector. Either way, we are strengthening the sector. And that um, yeah. was great to emphasize that. Um, Prof, I want to thank you very, very much. I want to close before uh, just five minutes to the hour. Um, I want to thank you very, very much. I know people enjoyed it a lot because I can see a lot of questions here um, and a lot of comments. Um, I know people enjoyed it a lot. I want to um, see if there's any final comments you've got, Prof. Um, no, not much, really. I mean, it's. Uh, I think, in fact, on your last comment, I just want the uh, one of the things that we have, we have, we're trying to kind of create within the National Graduate Academy is is facilitating the establishment of collaborating communities, uh, uh, namely people working in related areas. They need not be at the same university. And, and it's something that I feel really strongly about that um, people begin to know what people at other institutions are doing. And in the process, therefore, the students at University A will know what the expertise that exists at University B and so on. So it's something that also we should be working on. Other than that, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I always feel energized when I think about young people who are going to be the leaders of our system in 20, 30 years time. And it's our obligation, those of my generation, to do the best that we can to ensure that they, rea they realize their full potential of being the best that they can be as academics. Thank you very much, um, Prof, for these comments. And I see everybody's appreciative in the comments. And I'd like to encourage all of you to please look at the comments. There was a lot of um, um, ideas from Mpo, for instance, um, spoke about um, the resources of funding that you can access.
the ECRs and so forth, have a look at that. Um, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Many of you are regular um, participants here. Um, so I want to um, remind you all that we have our next Engage in two weeks. Your resources, recording and PowerPoint will be sent to you tomorrow as usual. I want to thank um, Prof. Luiso a lot for today's conversation um, and engagement. Um, we thank you very much. We join you again. We are here again in two weeks. And until then, I will encourage you and please ask you to please fill in the evaluation sheet. Um, I thank you all. Particularly, I want to thank Patrick Fish, Gisetso Malela, Michelle Buchler, and especially our director, Oliver Seal, who make these engagements on a monthly basis possible. Thank you, everyone. Take good care, and we we'll see you in about two weeks. Bye. Bye-bye.